Okay, so did you know that there are at least nine different ways that your child can learn a certain subject or a certain skill? And there are nine different ways that your child could show the teacher what they know and what they've learned. So today on our Facebook Live show, we're going to be jumping in and we're going to be looking at how we can merge the theory of multiple intelligences with the principles of universal design for learning. So if you were with us live last week or you watched the replay about universal design for learning, we talked about three ways that teachers can help kids be more successful in school. And these three ways happen to be the three principles of universal design for learning. So that is having multiple ways to present or give new information to help kids learn new skills and concepts nine different ways so not just lecture right there also is the second principle which is that we need to have multiple ways for kids to show us what they've learned so just taking a written test is one way that taps into some kids strengths but we need to be able to have other ways to evaluate what, what kids have learned. And then the third principle that we talked a little bit about last week was making sure that we're keeping kids engaged and motivated to learn in school. And one of the ways that we can do that is to give kids more choices. Choices about what work they do first. Choices about how they're going to present their book report, if it's going to be a PowerPoint, if it's going to be a play, if it's going to be a podcast, giving kids choices will keep them motivated and engaged. So if I haven't met you yet, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent of a son who happens to have Down syndrome. I was a special ed teacher for 15 years, a classroom teacher for 15 years. And since I retired, several years ago. <laughs> I've done full-time advocacy for families like you. So we're going to be using this one book that I love, which is called The Seven Ways of Teaching Today. Now, you can tell by the title that this is an older book <laughs> because since this book was published, Howard Gardner from Harvard University, who um, developed that theory has added two more types of intelligences. So we're going to be talking about that. Now I'm going to open up my computer because today I'm using my phone to go live and I want to check on my computer and see if in fact we are live. I've just had all kinds of technical problems today. And I can't see us live here either. So I don't know where we are. Where are we? <laughs> Upcoming events, photos. Ah. So I don't know. It's like a mystery, a mystery, a mystery. I don't get it. But we have... Two people. It's, oh, the book is mirrored. I know, Terry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's, you know, when I do Facebook Lives on my um, camera, I think there's something I'm supposed to switch to make it unmirrored. I'm not sure what that is, though. So we're just going to continue on. So I've got these nine cards, and each one represents a different type of intelligence. So let's start here with number one. And this type of intelligence is verbal linguistic word smart. So in our Western culture, we really um, revere people who have um, high verbal or linguistic abilities. However, not everyone has that. <laughs> but most students, most of us, at least have some of those verbal linguistic abilities, even if it's using a communication device, right? 
So what we want to do is, if we look at teaching math skills, which is what we're going to concentrate on today, like how can we teach math nine different ways? How can we have kids show us nine different ways that um, they are learning and can show us what they've learned. So we're going to use this handy dandy book and if we go to verbal linguistic and we look at mathematics. So this is, um, you know, one of the things that you can look at for kids if we want to use this to tap into their strength is to ask them to write their own math story problems or those math word problems. And they would give it to a neighbor to solve. Um, of course, the student would have to first solve it so they know the correct answer. But bringing in more linguistic answers or um, activities taps into this kind of intelligence. Or how about having your kids make up different puns using math vocabulary or terms? So kids that have highly developed verbal and linguistic abilities, they're going to tap into that math vocabulary, and that would be a way to um, help them understand that. So also having them work with a partner and having to explain to the partner about how they solve the problem. That would be a way to tap into verbal linguistic abilities. Um, a lot of times kids will like solving math crosswords. So again, you could use those math vocabulary terms and um, there's free programs on the computer that you can get to tap in or to make your own crossword puzzles or have the student make their own crossword puzzles for others to solve using just math vocabulary. Um, another thing that a lot of teachers have been doing for a number of years is to have students be able to explain how they got the answer. And for some kids it can be frustrating, but for kids that have highly developed verbal linguistic skills, they actually enjoy being able to either verbally explain how they got the answer or to do it in um, writing. So that would be one way to teach math skills. So let's look for, on our cards here, we're gonna go to number two, which is mathematical logical thinking. So since we're talking about math skills today, right? If somebody has highly developed mathematical logical intelligence, teaching them math <laughs> is going to be pretty easy or much um, more attuned to what their natural abilities are. So kids that have this logical um, type of thinking, you can use different kinds of math puzzles. Like Sudoku is a great way um, that you can have kids, you know, when they finish their work early, when they're at home waiting for some, you know, new activity to come, they can, you know, pick up a Sudoku book or the newspaper and um, solve problems like that, puzzle problems like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether or not kids should use calculators, you know, I think there are important things that calculators can be used for. Um, kids that have that mathematical, logical thinking um, sometimes will love doing it out by hand. Sometimes will love using a more sophisticated calculator like a graphing calculator. Um, when you look at this type of intelligence, having charts, having formulas, using graphs, all of those will tap into that type of intelligence. A lot of times using statistics. So, you know, look at what your child is interested in. If they're watching, you know, um, Olympics and they're getting all these statistics from the TV announcers, have them jot those down and say, you know, how much faster was this person than this person? Um, you know, and there's just different ways you can do simple things like how many medals has each country won so far and add those all up together. And so sometimes kids don't even realize <laughs> that they're working on math problems. 
So when you combine their using their intelligence, that's a type of strength with an interest that they have, then like you really hit the jackpot, right? So let me look if there's seven other ways here <laughs> that we can teach math to kids. And let me look up number three, which is musical intelligence. So for kids that have that music smartness, right? Um, and sometimes it's like, what? You know, how is how is music going to tie into teaching my child math? But there are things like there are um, a variety of music raps that go with teaching kids, you know, addition or multiplication facts. Your child could write his own song, write his own chant. Um, and perform that for the students in the class or use that as a way for him or her to review their math facts with you at home. If you look at um, one of the ideas was to use something like a drum or some percussion instrument and the kids could tap out to the drum beats <laughs> um, the different problems that you're giving them or look at their worksheet and then tap out you know, they could just do this, you know, on their desk or something like that. Um, but you want to try to incorporate that musical part in um, any kind of rhythm games that have to do with, you know, the math concept that they're learning. All of that will appeal to kids that have stronger musical type of intelligence. And while I'm thinking of it, if you are a parent that's in our online advocacy tools course, module three is all about multiple intelligences. And we really um, go in more depth in that online class about multiple intelligences. So let's look at a fourth way, which is visual spatial. And this is for you know a lot of students like my son who happens to have down syndrome he is such a visual learner that if we use visual supports like you know a visual schedule like photographs things like that that really helps him be able to not only learn new things but also he uses those visual skills to show teachers what he's um, learned in the classroom so visual learners, they you can do things like, um, let's see, again, I guess like a lot of the things like um, videos. So if you go on teaching videos, if you go to Khan Academy, which is K-A-H-N, Khan has some excellent math videos. So you can use those at home with your child. You can suggest that the teacher allow your child to use those in the classroom. Um, and that will tap into that um, visual area. Also, for kids learning different math formulas that have multiple steps, a visual way of teaching that is to color code the math formula and that, you know, just that simple thing of having different colors equal different steps in the formula can make a huge difference for kids that are visual learners. So let's move on. If you're here, say hi. I'm having a hard time. I don't know why seeing this come up on my computer, but hopefully... <laughs> Somebody else has seen us. Okay, let's go to number five, which is the body kinesthetic type of intelligence. Now, these are the kids that like to move and groove. And sometimes in our Western culture, that is really not accepted in so many classrooms, which makes it really hard because there's some kids that cannot focus unless they are up and about and moving around. So as parents, as teachers, how do we tap into this body kinesthetic type of learner when we're teaching them math? Well, a, a lot of times what you can do oh, is, now my battery's low, oh dear, is to 
do things like adding and subtracting and using actual people in the classroom. And let me grab my charger here for my phone. You know, do you have those days where it's like, maybe I should go back to bed, try this again. I feel like this is maybe going to be one of those days. Okay, so we're going to talk about body kinesthetic type of learners. Those kids that like to move and groove in the classroom. So you can do things like take the class outside. Hey, Lisa. And do math activities outside and use balls. And so bouncing the balls to, you know, to work on addition or multiplication facts and you know, bouncing the ball against the wall and doing things like that. So you want to give kids permission to be moving about. So another thing is for kids to act out story problems. So, you know, sometimes when kids have those word or story problems, it's like it makes no sense to them. But if you can actually get kids to volunteer, you know, to come up and to act out those word problems, then kids are like, ah, now I get what they're talking about. Um, or creating a play around the math concept and having kids act that out. Giving them manipulatives is going to be really crucial because then again, they have permission to use those math manipulatives. So things like um, tangrams is a great thing to give them to, you know, use when they're studying geometry or any kind of objects for counting. Um, when you're teaching algebra skills, you know, use a balance beam, not a balance beam, a balance scale because you have to have each side of the equation balance out. And there's multiple ways that you can bring in the use of manipulatives when you're teaching math. And kids that are more of those hands-on kind of learners, that's going to be something that um, really helps them. The other thing that you can use are Legos. I mean, how many of our kids are like, Lego? <laughs> they just love Legos. So you know, give them time to explore with them, but then when it's time for math, use Legos in a building way. So kids are going to use Legos and build the equations that way. And they're going to share with their neighbor and they're going to each try to solve each other's Lego math equation. Um, so the idea is that we're creative, that we come up with more than, you know, this is your math worksheet. I want you to use paper and pencil to figure this out. Um, so we've got some more ways. So our sixth way of helping kids learn math is for people that have that interpersonal type of intelligence. So kids that shine with interpersonal are going to love doing math um, with a partner or talking about math problems with a small group and helping each other solve them that way. We can also look at, I was looking here for some of the ideas, is um, I'm sure you've probably heard the expression that when you teach somebody else a new skill or a concept that you actually learn it more. So having students volunteer to be the teacher, either in the small group or to the whole class, and tell the group how they solve the problem is a great thing to do. Um, when I was a second grade teacher, it was like always like so fascinating to me when I would ask kids to explain you know, how they thought of that. It's like there's so many other ways than maybe just that one way that we were taught. So it's important for kids to share that and know that there's more than one way to come up with that right answer in math. Um, so yeah, a lot of interpersonal type of learners are gonna really thrive when they can work with another person. Now, that's the opposite of our seventh way of teaching math, which has to do with those students that are high on the intra 
personal and that's more of your independent workers so usually um, teachers will have a time in the classroom where they present a lesson and then give the students time to work on you know some independent part of the lesson and so if your child is one of those more kind of like you know just I don't know like thinking inside and um, really likes to be by himself or herself likes to reflect on things that is more of an intra type of intra personal type of um, learner so things like using guided imagery um, that can help these type of learners having them set their own goals so instead of being worried about you know what <laughs> what the curriculum maybe is saying instead if kids can have more responsibility for like this is my goal for today um, and I'm going to keep track of it and they have maybe a graph that they keep inside their desk and they record how many problems they did that day and in a different color they record how many problems they got correct that day and that's just something that they do for themselves it's not a big class chart and people get compared but it's more of an individual thing um, so the other thing that a lot of intrapersonal type of learners like is self-checking activities and you can see this in a variety of different math workbooks where um, you know maybe you go to the end of the book and there's the answer so the student can get not only like immediate reinforcement when they've answered the math problem but they also can find out if they've missed it and they can go back and and refigure that so this is really important because I think a lot of times we don't recognize that there are so many different ways that our kids can be learning now the two there's two new types of intelligences that were added um, after the 1980s after the 1990s and the the eighth type of intelligence that was added was the naturalistic intelligence and this is the kids that are like so into things like animals and nature and I know let's say you guys are training a service dog now so you know that might be an area that your son would be interested in so how do you tap into teaching math with kids that are into nature um, I had one mom email me a while ago and her son is blind but he loves science activities and so one of the things that they've that she suggested to the teacher at the in the school is to have him, have a variety of nature kinds of objects like rocks and feathers and seashells and things like that for this child who is blind for him to have those as his manipulatives instead of maybe some of the standard things that you might be in a classroom um, so thinking about what your child is interested in what is kind of a um, innate you know quality and strength for them and how we can teach math that way so another thing that you can look at for naturalistic learners are categorizing because that's like a huge math skill right so they can categorize different kinds of animals um, they can um, do things like if you have a class pet or you have a pet at home they can calculate how much food your pet eats every day how much food that you need for a week or a month or how much food is left and how long that's going to last the pet so you know you're still working on math problems but you're doing it from an area that's a strength for them as far as um, looking at natural nature kinds of things the other thing that I love about teaching math with kids that are um, more nature smart is the whole Fibonacci sequence I even just love saying Fibonacci <laughs> so um, this is a sequence that you find in nature with pine cones um, you find it in shells so it's 
you know, I'm not going to go into the whole mathematical part of it now, but that is a way, you know, you can help kids tap into that area of strength. Now, the most recent inti um, intelligence that was added was the existential intelligence, or sometimes people call it the spiritual intelligence. And this is kids that um, are drawn to asking those big questions like, why did God do this? Or why is the sky blue? Or how did this happen? How did, you know, we come to be? So these are more of your like really deep thinkers. So if we're looking at, okay, we've got this kind of a student in our classroom, how are we going to teach this student some math skills? So some ideas are to connect the math problem to real life experiences. Hey, Erica. Um, and instead of being this, you know, typical story problem of the train left Chicago at 12 o'clock noon and arrived in Denver <laughs> and like figuring out the speed of the train, instead think about what this child might be interested in or what they might be experiencing in real life and use that type of a math word problem with students that have this spiritual type of intelligence it's usually a good idea to start from the big concept and then break it down into smaller steps but a lot of times these type of kids want to see that big picture before you go into all of the details um, again sometimes kids will want to look at what are the different ways that we can summarize, you know, all of the different math concepts that we've learned today. Um, journaling is a big thing that taps into the ex existential type of um, learner. And journaling we often think of as a reading or a writing activity, but it also journaling for math can be something where the kids just reflect. They, they stop at the end of the math lesson and they reflect on what they've learned and they write down some thoughts or some questions that they still have. And, you know, so the whole idea is that we want teachers to tap into how our kids are smart. And our kids are smart in at least nine different ways. And some of those types of intelligences are more developed than others. But as a teacher, as a parent, if we can recognize where our kids' strengths are and use that when we're teaching them new things, use that when we're asking them to show us what they've learned, we will be so much more successful and we will have such engaged, motivated, powerful students ready to come the next day and be excited about learning because that's what we want, right? We want kids excited and engaged and actively participating and not just filling out worksheet after worksheet after worksheet. So if this has been interesting for you, like I said, if you're in our Advocacy Tools online class, check out module three. There's a ton more information there about each of the types, each of the nine types of intelligences and how you can tap into those. Now next week, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about reading skills and how you can teach reading in nine different ways, how kids can show you what they've learned in reading nine different ways. So I hope this has been useful. I am Charmaine Tanner, and I'm passionate about helping you become an even more effective advocate for your child so you can tap into their strengths and you can help them shine in the classroom. So Erica, this is called Seven Ways of Teaching, and what I'll do is I'll come back into our post and I'll type out some of the books. I have some other books that are really good too. Um, and I know Erica is um, a great one to go to the public library and check out books. 
and if it's not in your library, Erica knows how to request them, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, you don't have to go on Amazon and buy these books. You can check them out from your library, and they should have um, an assortment of books about multiple intelligences, um, and there also are um, quite a few different websites that you can go on to and learn about multiple intelligences that way too. So I think when we combine this with universal design for learning, our kids will be so much more successful. So I hope you have a great week. I shall see you next Thursday at noon Mountain Time and we'll be talking about reading skills next week. So take care. Bye-bye.